Okay, welcome. We have quite an international crowd today. We have uh, attendees joining us from Brazil, from the US, from India, from Guatemala. So welcome to everybody. I'm really excited for today's discussion. And thank you for joining us. So we're here today to discuss edge computing, uh, AI and cybersecurity together with Hub Security's very own CTO and co-founder, Andre Yarmenko, alongside a number of distinct AI and edge computing experts, including Nitu Koshu, Sam Armani, Jason Shepard, Vera Seldikova, Ildiko Vansha, and Nancy Shemwell. Uh, we'll start our webinar with a brief introduction from Andre Armenko on today's discussion topic. And then our panelists will each get the chance to briefly introduce themselves. Afterwards, we'll get into a bit of a deeper discussion on everything that's related to edge computing uh, and AI security, including its ongoing threats and solutions. Um, as usual, we'll leave about 30 minutes at the end of our discussion for a short Q&A. So like I said, if you have any questions throughout the discussion, drop them below and we will get to them later on. Now, we have an impressive lineup of panelists tonight and I'm excited to have them each introduce themselves to you. But first, we'll begin with a few words from Andre uh, Yaromenko, Hub Security CTO, uh, before we hand off the mic for introductions. Uh, Andre, are you here? Welcome to, to our panel today. Yes, hello, Stephanie. Hello, everyone. Nice to meet you all. So I'm Andre Sition, co-founder in Hub Security, and uh, I'm coming from a primarily a cybersecurity background in the Israeli military and the defense industry. And I'm very excited to be on this uh, panel today with the uh, ex very experienced participants coming from diverse backgrounds in the age IoT. Uh, and uh, actually to open maybe it's uh, the first question could be what is an, what is an edge and uh, where does it start and where does it stop? And it seems like today that uh, the edge that started with the very small low power devices is continuously growing and expanding uh, into uh, many more industries and, um, and concepts and solutions. So it is today a very uh, complex infrastructure and very complex environment that uh, requires um, many different points of view and the experiences to, to handle also from performance, from cybersecurity and uh, communication and definitely uh, AI and uh, privacy laws like GDPR. And uh, I'm really looking forward for, uh, for all of us together to cover all the different topics and uh, what uh, constitutes an age and uh, how do I handle all the challenges uh, on the edge devices and uh, as part of the continuous uh, network and the uh, end-to-end solutions. Thank you, Andre. Well, we're glad that you could take the time to be here with us today. Um, and now I'd like to take a chance to um, just a few minutes to do a quick introduction round, maybe starting with Nitu. Uh, would you mind giving our listeners a bit of background on yourself and your field of expertise? Um, followed by Sam, and um, I will call you out one by one, maybe. So go ahead, Nita. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, a very good morning and afternoon and evening to everybody here on the conference today. My name is Nita Kaushal, and I'm the general manager for Compute Edge IoT and Digital Solutions here at Hewlett Packard Enterprise, looking after from all the way from large enterprises to the small medium enter uh, enterprise businesses right the way across UK, Middle East, Ireland and South Africa markets. I'd probably say that uh, this topic is very topical for me because uh, the space of edge becomes very interesting as we start to think about where we need to process data. And if we think about the direction we get from Gartner 50% of workloads will be generated at the edge by 2022 from enterprises. So this means the role of edge becomes more and more important for our customers and our people going forwards. 
and how we get to help them in that space becomes a, a very interesting topic for businesses like Hewlett Packard Enterprise. So very happy to be here. Great, thank you Nitu, and we're glad that you could be here with us today. Um, I think I hand over next to Sam. Uh, thank you, Shtarni. Hi, everyone. Good day and evening to everyone attending. It's a pleasure to be here uh, with uh, everyone on this panel. Uh, I'm Sam Armani. I'm Vice President of Business Development uh, at Mimic. Uh, my background is engineering. I've been with uh, Mimic since early on in various roles, uh, product management, operations, acting CEO for a couple of years, and for the past few years, I've been in charge of business development, uh, strategic partnerships, alliances, and customer acquisition. Uh, before that, I was with another startup called Movidia, which was, uh, we were working on uh, transport layer protocol optimization over wireless, working with telcos around the world uh, heavily back then, and the company was sold to App Annie. And before that, I was with Sage Software, uh, again, in a couple of different roles uh, from development to leading uh, a team of product analysts. So my uh, career, it's all been in software and past few years focused on edge heavily, which we're gonna get into discussion on that. Thank you so much. Great, thank you so much, Sam. And also we're glad that you could be here today. Um, Jason, you're next. Uh, hey everyone, glad to be here. <laughs> so um, my uh, my role is at, at Zadita, I'm building up our ecosystem. So that's both in the open source sense, uh, working with communities uh, out there and because and the root of our solution is, is in open source at the edge, um, which is super important because the edge is so complex. You need to be able to collaborate across a broad community. We monetize at Zadita a cloud controller that, that talks to that open source component and helps you scale these things. Uh, many people start with, uh, you know, the right way to start is with a use case. You're actually doing this stuff for a reason. And then you start with an application. And then you realize after you get past POC party of one that, man, how do I actually scale this in the real world? That's when we become really relevant. Um, my background, you know, my motto is if it's fuzzy, I'm on it. I've been in R&D uh, things for a long time, CTO uh, roles. Um, you know, I, before joining Zadita about a year and a half ago, I was CTO for IoT and Edge at Dell Technologies, working across the portfolio, helped build that business in 2014 from scratch up to where we are today, launched a project in open source called Edge X Foundry that just hit 7 million downloads. Uh, so it, it, we've been around the block in terms of ecosystem. So yeah, again, glad to be here. Great. Thank you, Jason. Vera? Hi, all. Um, my name is Vera Serdyakova. I've been building products with HAI capabilities, I would say since 2014, uh, you know, back in the days when it was still embedded, <laughs> a less fancy term for HAI. Uh, currently, I work as an AI product manager at LG Silicon Valley Lab. And here we build products in the field of HAI that we define as on-device machine learning. Prior to LG, I was uh, primarily working in conversational AI so building speech-enabled interfaces for Bosch uh, robotics, connected car, and smart home products. And uh, I'm really excited to uh, join the panel today and just exchange uh, experiences and uh, perspectives with this really diverse group of panelists. Great, thank you so much, Vera. I'm also glad that you could join us. Um, happy that you could be here. Um, I think next I will ask El Dico. Yes, hi, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Ildiko Vancha. I work for the Open Infrastructure Foundation. Some of you may have heard of it as OpenStack Foundation. Uh, we transitioned uh, into the new name and brand uh, end of last year. Uh, before the foundation, I worked for a telecom vendor uh, on their uh, cloud platform solution for telco networks. And I joined the foundation roughly four and a half years ago. Um, within the Open Infra Foundation, I have focus areas around telecom, NFV, and um, edge computing. Um, I'm co-chair for um, the uh, Open Infra Edge Computing Group. It is a top-level working group under the foundation. We are looking into the challenges of edge computing in terms of infrastructure and massively distributed systems. Uh, so we are more looking into edge from the perspective of core to edge or edge to core. Um, I'm also a community manager for one of our projects called Starting X. It is uh, an open source uh, cloud platform fine-tuned for edge and IoT use cases. 
Um, and just in general, I'm a big advocate for open source. I think it's the future of collaboration and software development. Thank I'm you. Say it again for people in the back. That's great. Um, and last but not least, we have Nancy. Nancy Shemwell. Good morning or good afternoon, good evening around the world. Um, my name is Nancy Shemwell, and I am the COO of Trilogy Networks, which is a company that is um, purpose built to deploy distributed multi tenant cloud platforms across one and a half million square miles with edge compute capability in rural America. Our focus is very specifically 5G, agriculture and energy solutions. We'll get into more of that and, and why those are so important to rural America. Um, as a matter of introduction, I'm probably an anomaly on this group because I'm not an engineer. I am a business uh, manager that have come up the ranks of, of sales and marketing and into general management have been the CEO of a couple of startups as well as C-suites in some major corporations. But really looking at these emerging technologies and the emerging business requirements for them as it changes the world through this launch of Industrial 4.0. So I'm, I'm really honored and excited to be a part of this panel and look to learn a lot from uh, my fellow panelists. Thank you. Great, thank you, Nancy. It's probably important to know that the last few startups have been around uh, uh, cyber, with, uh, with an IoT or an industrial IoT solution, uh, a stent at the global IoT um, community, IoT communities, as well as now this very specific edge corporation. Well, we're glad that you can join us today so we can get a bit of a business perspective as well um, on this topic. Um, I wanted to just start off, uh, we're gonna touch on a few topics, but I wanted to just start off by maybe defining uh, some core terms and maybe Nitu, you can start us off by answering a very simple question, which is what is AI processing? Maybe you can throw in a definition for edge while you're at it. I'll just come off neat there. Okay, big question. The thing with artificial intelligence is it's, re it's a really big term and I guess Throwing in edge in there is also a, another big topic, but maybe I will flip it the other way if that's okay with you, Stromi. I would love to start with the topic of edge and thinking about what edge means to, to me and my customers and my business. I think the definition of what edge means is slightly different. And then I see the capability of AI to then plug into that. So if I think about what, uh, what edge really is um, for, for our customers, edge becomes a way of being able to think about how we process data where proximity really matters. And if I think about it from my background is telco, by the way, so I, I've, I've got 20 years in, in, tel in telco and and the way that we thought about um, the, you know, the space of edge was we look back and we thought, okay, so how does our network really change over the last few generations? And if we look at what happened in the space of telco, 2G was about audio, 3G became about messaging and browsing, 4G became about consumer video sharing and social media apps. And then 5G for us is all about business acceleration. So what new things can we drive for businesses to help them accelerate and digitize? So then when I think about that aspect, that backdrop of the network, then we think about, okay, so what, what does edge really mean there for our customers? And I kind of break it down into two big buckets. One is the local edge. So this is where you're capturing data, where it's being created. So let's imagine a video camera, for example, in an airport. There's a lot of different activity. There's many different cameras. How you're actually then capturing that data from these uh, cameras and then processing that data near real term to drive action-led results is, is what we define as the local edge. So you're going to need some sort of capability where the data is being captured. Because if you 
don't have it uh, there and the proximity does not matter, you introduce long latency. So some of the, the decisions that you want to make in, in real time are not really feasible. Then I guess the second thing is, is the, the network edge. So where, where latency matters, but it's driven within the network. And I guess this is where the, um, the role of 5G plays a big role because today processing data in the network edge um, doesn't really drive that low latency capability that applications really require at this stage. So what I would probably say here is, is that the advent of 5G and working with cloud network providers is enabling that low latency capability that some of these new um, uh, applications then require. So for me, that's what, what I see as edge. But if I'm then thinking about what artificial intelligence means in that space, you know, thinking about the network, thinking about the generation of technologies, right the way across the different generations. For us, it's, it's actually a tool and artificial intelligence for us is very simple. It's a way of being able to capture information but then drive real action led results from the analytics and machine learning that we're driving from an operational perspective. So for us, it's, it's real stuff that's happening today. It's real stuff that we're able to drive as an outcome, outcome today. And I did want to give one small example to just bring it to life, because I think examples and real business stories help our people and customers to understand what does what is AI really capable of doing today? What kind of machine learning applications are really running today? And from a Hewlett Packard enterprise, I was really inspired by some of the work that took place last year. And what we were able to do is we were able to help with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And what we were able to do is take simulations and biological and chemical processes. We were able to analyze all of that. We were able to understand the variety of different strains that were coming from the virus and then be able to see what the actions and the interactions were with the humans and at the molecular level so that we could then start supporting drug research. And I'm really pleased to share that through artificial intelligence and processing data at the edge in a variety of different um, labs right the way across the US and France, we were able to then develop and help create some of the vaccinations that were developed for this year that have been rolled out. So just to mention a few, I know that we've got an audience here, particularly from uh, the US, we were working with the Department of Energy's Aragon National Lab, for example. We also worked with the Lawrence Livermore National Lab in the US and also in France, the National Center of Scientific Research. So these are areas that we've actually deployed real life AI machine learning capabilities, looking at real data to drive real action led results. Oh, that's great. And thank you for providing an example also for our audience. Uh, but a real-world application uh, for edge computing. I'm, I'm going to ask Sam now, your VP at Mimic, uh, which is a pioneer in hybrid edge cloud technology, maybe you can break down for our attendees what we mean when we talk about um, hybrid edge cloud. What exactly does it entail? Sure, thank you, Sterney. So um, let me start by saying that uh, we are in the midst of transitioning from uh, a mobile internet world to a hyper-connected world. So in the mobile internet world, the mobile devices connected to internet to consume data. And therefore it was the birth of the web services. Now in the hyper-connected world, it's all about X to X communication. Everything needs to talk to everything. Um, and it's also about, it's also where the digital uh, meets every aspect of our physical world. What that means is that, for instance, your connected car needs to talk to the smart devices at home. At the same time, it needs to talk to the smart city infrastructure or talk to the other vehicles in the vicinity for V2V and V2X related use cases, or your connected thermostat needs to communicate with your solar panel, so on and so forth. 
So there are all these devices in our life that needs to communicate with each other all the time in real time to achieve certain tasks. Now, before I get into Mimic's hybrid edge cloud platform, let me say what uh, we mean by uh, the big word of edge. Uh, to us, all these devices that are um, uh, that are generating data, so which is usually devices that are running the application, um, are considered edge device. Uh, you can think about it as any compute uh, that is outside of the data center and has some memory processing power, storage, and connectivity is considered edge uh, device to us now. What hybrid edge cloud platform does, it simply enables all these computing devices to act as cloud servers and discover and connect and communicate with other devices in a peer to peer fashion at the application level and only go to the central cloud when needed, for instance, for running global functions. And that's why we call it hybrid. Uh, so we're not offering something to replace the central cloud. No, it's quite the opposite. In fact, uh, we have we are partners with some of the largest cloud providers, and we're working with them closely. What we're really doing, we are extending the cloud capability all the way to the edge to all this compute that is sitting on the edge uh, near consumers, and by doing that, in fact, we're over time, and we're now building a cloud out of all these computing devices, which eventually will be much larger in a scale than the central cloud as it is today, right? Now, our platform uh, uh, is used by application developers in every industry vertical for their application development purposes. And what it really enables them to do, it enables them to develop their application, the front end application in a microservice serverless architecture, such that now some of the functions are running as part of the application on the end device. Right Today, the entire brain of all these apps that we're using is on the central cloud. Our platform is bringing some of that down to the device as part of the application. Now, uh, so I'm going to get into the benefits of that later. But uh, what uh, we're really uh, doing with our hybrid edge cloud technology is it's all about powering up the hyper-connected world digital economy by unlocking the next generation of applications. So that's uh, that's on the hybrid edge cloud. Great, thank you so much, Sam, for breaking that down for us. Um, Eldiko, I'd like to ask you, what do you see as the biggest challenge of edge computing right now? And uh, does it have anything to do with open infrastructure? Yes, um, so I, I have three angles um, to answer this question. And um, the first is kind of the edge in edge computing um, and bringing in the human factor a little bit. Uh, over the past like three years, I participated in a lot of discussions where people started to argue about what edge is and trying to come up with a definition that could rule them all, you know, what's the edge. Uh, but I think we already had two great examples on this panel to see how diverse edge is and how different it can be based on your particular interest and point of view. Um, so I think one of the big challenges is from the human perspective to let go of our need to define everything and rather tell others what our edge looks like um, and what our context is. And um, with this focus on edge, um, I also experienced that sometimes we get to forget about that the edge is part of a larger system. Uh, so practically we end up with uh, massively distributed systems and often these are becoming more and more heterogeneous and organically growing environments. Um, so challenges, for instance, interoperability um, are things that we sort of solve on some levels already. However, with the scale and complexity of edge, they are coming back to the spotlight again. Um, so on a little detour, um, if 
um, you look around in your daily life, life um, most of us are kind of consumed by digitalization and technology already. And in fact, technology evolution is kind of uh, crucial for human success. And with that, uh, everyone should have access to technology and to this evolution. And uh, this is partially why I'm such a big advocate for open source. Uh, because that is really a way to give access to people on how software is getting created and to the artifact itself as well. Um, so in that sense, if you look into infrastructure from the perspective of having the ability to have open source solutions and participating in uh, the creation process, I think that uh, that's a big step towards really solving the challenge of interoperability by collaborating on defining APIs and interfaces between the components. And um, the third angle is um, that edge computing itself is really a technology evolution. So we don't have to invent everything from scratch. There are a lot of existing solutions that we can start uh, to build on and evolve further. So if you look into the Open Infrastructure Foundation, we have a lot of projects, but there's only one that's uh, fully focused on edge computing and it's starting as I mentioned already, but we have a couple of other projects too, which are relevant in this space, even though they are not addressing edge computing as their primary uh, use case, like Kata containers, which is a container runtime and containers are getting uh, uh, increasingly important for edge. So uh, it is really great to work with these communities and participate and see how people are collaborating towards evolving these projects further um, to be able to fulfill the new requirements of the new edge computing use cases. And we're also collaborating a lot with adjacent communities like projects under LF Edge or the Kubernetes Edge groups and more. So here's also a call for action for um, the attendees on this panel that uh, please go and, and participate in relevant open source groups and, and communities and be part of this working for the common good. <laughs> Great, thank you so much, Ildiko. Um, definitely, Nitro, I want to circle back to you. Maybe you can give us just a bit more, uh, a few more maybe examples, how you, what you see as edge from a telco and then an infrastructure perspective while we're on the topic of infrastructure. Sure. I guess just building on um, what I'm hearing from uh, this great panel already and talking about devices, talking to devices, Thinking about that kind of local edge where uh, proximity really matters, I'm thinking about uh, a, a variety of different use cases that are going to be coming across, these net new applications that are emerging, finding ways to um, handle accidents, uh, fault handling to, we already talked about the CCTV triggers and also car telemetry, but uh, what, what I'm thinking about in this space is uh, we're seeing a couple of uh, interesting areas emerging at this kind of local edge. Definitely lots more happening in the spaces of uh, medical devices, more in the IoT gateways because the advent of IoT connecting new devices has emerged right the way from uh, 3G cellular to 4G and also narrowband IoT and a variety of other different types of IoT uh, network technologies. Autonomous driving as well. So how, how the network starts to play a role in, in helping some of that autonomous driving vehicle experiences, um, emergency responses as well, and also how factories and warehouses in manufacturing areas are starting to become much more optimal in the way that they're working. So these are just some examples that, um, that we're seeing from an industry perspective that are starting to take up and emerge in the space of the edge. And I think th these are ones that we see at the kind of local edge where that latency topic really matters. So this high-end technology backbone becomes super important, um, but there's plenty of things that you will also see emerging from um, examples where uh, maybe latency can be forgiven a little bit. And this is driven in, in, a, in a more of a central cloud environment, thinking about uh, 
artificial intelligence, just in time delivery, inventory, uh, more around IoT anomaly detection, um, security policies, etc. So th those are the kind of areas that uh, I see telco businesses getting involved in. Oh, definitely, the list goes on and on. Um, Jason, I'm going to ask you, maybe you can expand a bit more on your definition of edge and what would you say is the next big thing in edge computing? Yeah, cool. So um, all good stuff. Uh, Sam, to Sam's point, we say the edge is the last cloud to build. Um, you know, simply put, and you know, Dico, it's you know, open source is the modern way to drive standards. It just is. I mean, you can get in the room and create specs, or you can work on code and have something tangible that creates a snowball effect. So, super important. We share very similar uh, beliefs there. Um, edge is a continuum. I actually think it's extremely important to define it um, because people talk past each other a lot right now. There's a lot of data center uh, stuff that is not applicable out in the field. Um, people tend to have a myopic vision is like, you know, my edge is what matters. And the fact is, is that there's trade-offs. And so there's two big buckets when you look at it. And, you know, need to, you've been talking about sort of the telco edge as an example. There's, there's service providers that are at, on the, the network side upstream of the wider network. And there's users downstream of the wider network. And latency, if it's latency critical, you will always compute that on-prem or in the field at the, the local edge, as Nitu said. If it is latency sensitive, you have benefits to aggregate those services across large users by centralizing it across the wide area network. It's a massive difference. So putting in the, we've been talking about cars, latency critical workloads like driving the car will never ever be driven from the cloud. There's people out there actually saying 5G is so fast you can drive your car from the cloud. That's insane, never gonna happen. But infotainment, augmented reality, the C2V you know, stuff that we're talking about, like uh, uh, connecting cars at intersections and then tying that into a, a smartphone, like you know, uh, Sam provided that example, like that's the kind of stuff that you're gonna see from the service provider edge. Um, you know, killer app for edge computing is computer vision, anything related to computer vision. Anyone that tells you that uh, computer, you should send all the video to the cloud to process it is basically selling you connectivity. You know, uh, otherwise you want to process it, you know, locally, like, like me too was saying, and, and only trigger events. Vibration analysis. You do not want to send 8,000 hertz vibration to the cloud, you know, if you're doing predictive maintenance. That's bad news. You know, you want to analyze it locally and send, you know, values. So, so, so it is important to think, you know, the three criteria on edge. Is it on a WAN or a LAN relative to the process? Local area network for anything critical, wide area network for scale for anything um, that you want to you know, do, you know, uh, get across a lot of people, but it's latency sensitive. Is it in a physically secure data center or is it not? There's a lot of stuff out in the field where people can walk up to it and touch it. That's when bad things happen. You have to have a very specific zero trust security model. And then the last one is, is it so constrained that you can no longer do the principles of cloud native development, uh, you abstract workloads, containers, virtual machines? It, once it's so constrained, it becomes really, really complex. Death by a thousand cuts where every management solution or every application is embedded and everything is custom. The closer you get from the cloud to the physical world, exponentially, everything gets more complex. Hardware, software, uh, diverse skill sets, use cases, you know, it's hard. And so that's why it's super important to recognize Edge as a continuum. If In a perfect world, you centralize everything in the cloud, but for all the reasons we're talking about, you don't. Uh, we're, we're seeing the need not to. You have to accommodate this heterogeneous stuff and the data center paradigm is trickling down, but you also have to focus very specifically on distributed paradigm. Uh, so that's what Zidia does. We, we rooted our solution in open source. It's EvoS from, from LF Edge. And you know, as, as Adiko mentioned, we're, we're you know, increasingly collaborating between LF Edge and, and the infrastructure project, but um, our cloud is, is a SaaS offer, easy button. You, know, you don't have to have any IT skills to go manage stuff out in, in, in the field. Um, and, and the open source component, why it's so important is that if you are trying to deal with the massively diverse landscape of hardware in the field, all kinds of gateways and hubs and routers and servers and silicon and you know, whatever, if you don't abstract that complexity, it is really, really hard. You have to have the security model. So EvoS is an example, it taps into root of trust. It does measure boot, remote attestation. It can run any combination of virtual machines, containers, clusters, you name it. Um, but it does it down to 512 megabytes of memory. Data center solutions have 64 gigabytes of memory requirement. 
very big different or difference. Um, you know, a lot of people are talking past each other. Um, oh, the footprint's tiny. Well, what does tiny mean to you? Oh, 64 gigabytes. No, no, no. Tiny to an OT person is five kilobytes. Um, you know, this is more the technical side. Uh, conversations around real time. Um, hey, building automation person, what's real time to you? 15 minutes. Hey, manufacturing person, what's real time to you? A microsecond. It's very different. So that's why I think it's important. Um, and, and the last thing I'll say, the next big thing, it's, it's about interconnected ecosystems. Uh, you know, Sam, you mentioned this, you know, the, the home speaking with the retail or utilities crossing over supply chains city. This will never, ever, ever happen without an open foundation. Imagine if the internet was owned by one company, eh, it wouldn't have panned out so well. So to build this hybrid environment that you know, we're all talking about, you must have trust. And one of the things, so I got Edgex started with a group of people. The next big thing that we're working on is this thing called Project Alvarium. Uh, there's been some recent stuff uh, being talked about and you can go to alvarium.org, but this is about this notion of trust fabrics where you have interconnected um, trust fabrics that deliver data with confidence across networks, not just ledger, not just blockchain, all kinds of things, open APIs, immutable storage, blockchain, confidential computing layered together. And then it generates algorithms that sends data across networks in a trusted fashion. This is the next big thing in terms of interconnecting all of these different use cases. You cannot take people out to dinner fast enough one by one to build trust across a global scale. You must bake it into the technology. Definitely. Thank you, Jason, for that perspective. Um, Nancy, I want to I want to ask you uh, just real quick. Where is this all heading, right? We know edge computing will be big, but how how big will it be? Um, how big will that be? So our focus is rural, as I'd mentioned earlier, and and on our board of advisors. So we've built an ecosystem to to Jason's point of sixty different um, suppliers, technology suppliers rural carriers as well as application providers that are all working on how, how do we solve and deploy networks in, across rural America. And so we have a, a pretty outstanding board of advisors that are helping us with people like Carolyn Chen from Intel, as well as the um, board members from CTIA and CCA. A, et cetera. But one of the people that we just added is Chad Roop, who is the uh, outgoing USDA administrator. And so I was asking him this question yesterday, how big is big for rural, rural America? And he said, Nancy, think about electricity in the 30s, right? So if you think about that for just a minute, if you think about what people anticipated they would do with electricity in the 30s as it started to roll out across um, the world. That is truly where we are with broadband and edge compute capabilities. As I listen to this team talk about a number of the applications and the things that they see developing. I couldn't agree with Jason more than the, the computer vision is everything in rural America. Take that down to an ag application. Being able to look at crops and understand when a disease is starting to happen in advance of that infestation taking over the entire field. It is just massive for this industry. So currently there are like 75 million IoT devices in farming alone. We've got to find ways to get them connected, but this is a multi-trillion dollar business to unlock these applications. And to a question that Mike had asked, you know, was it going to, was this deployment going to happen in rural or wait until urban is saturated? There is massive opportunity with large industrial IoT. Well, where does that large industrial IoT sit? It sits on farms and it sits on energy sources. And where do those things reside? They reside in the middle of nowhere around the world. So how do we enable these rural markets through a variety of both public and private networks to be able to unlock the true value of this technology 
by delivering low latency capability. So this is massive, yeah. a long, long answer to it's trillions of dollars and it will evolve forever. Okay, thank you for bringing that perspective. I don't think, um, I think that's definitely not, a, at least it hasn't been on, on my mind. I think when we have different, we have different industries here represented, uh, rural America is definitely one of them that we should be starting to think about, especially when it comes to ag tech, like you say. Um, I'm going to jump to our next topic, which is AI usage at the edge. But before we do, I just want to remind our audience, if you have questions, you can put them in the Q&A section below, and we're going to have a discussion towards the end. So feel free to, to drop them there and we will get to them. Um, my next question is for Vera. What are your thoughts on training and uh, machine learning models at the edge? Do you, do you think that the practice is uh, mature enough for real life application? or do you think it still needs more development? Uh, thank you, Sharni. That's an excellent question. Just before <laughs> I jump into it, I realize we have a really diverse audience. So just uh, uh, let me, let's uh, define a couple of things, right? So that everybody understands what we're talking about here. So um, uh, when it comes to machine learning, right? There are two uh, two really critical processes when it, uh, one is training the model, right? Essentially uh, exposing it to data uh, to garner insights. And the next process is inferencing or decision-making based on this model that has been previously built. So uh, if I understand you correctly, you're actually referring to the training or learning part of the machine learning pipeline. So uh, while and uh, please correct me if I'm <laughs> wrong in my interpretation here. But uh, basically the inferencing at the edge has been out in the wild uh, on the market for quite a while. I would say the past five to seven years we've seen multiple commercial applications. Whereas the training uh, part has been way more nascent and emerging. Uh, but where it is now, let me answer that from two uh, different perspectives. One perspective is more of market introduction and adoption, and another one is uh, more of uh, technology maturity. So when it comes to market introduction, I would say that most of us are actually using applications that leverage learning at the edge. So think of, for example, uh, Gboard you might be using on your Android device or uh, Face ID you might be using on iPhone. These are real life products that are using training at the edge. So from this perspective, I think it's quite fair to say that training at the edge is you know, mature enough for real time, uh, for real life applications. However, there is uh, another perspective to it or you know something that you might call a caveat. So uh, the technical perspective, there are three approaches of how you can train a machine learning model at the edge, right? This uh, one is what they call uh, model refinement, essentially where you pre-train the model usually on the cloud or on-prem and then you just refine or retrain it on edge device. Uh, another approach is some sort of collaborative learning. Uh, so uh, federated learning is a more famous representative of this group where you leverage a network of devices to train a unified model. And the last but not the least is so-called exclusive training where you perform all the training of machine learning model uh, solely on edge device. So the reason I go into these uh, practicalities is that while we see quite a bit of applications and you know, uh, commercial products leveraging the first two techniques, especially refinement, model refinement uh, and federated learning, the uh, exclusive training is still very nascent and is definitely just slowly coming out of academia. So to summarize, uh, in some perspectives, training at the edge is catching up uh, with inference on the edge, but these are still pretty limited techniques that are being leveraged on the commercial scale. Thank you, Vera. Um, I'd like to, to have maybe um, Adiko expand on that a bit. How do you see edge computing creating new solutions and opportunities um, 
within different industries with the help of um, AI and machine learning? Um, yeah, um, so uh, we talked already a, a, a lot about like the, the rural areas and, and farms. Um, so I mentioned the opening for edge computing group in my intro, and um, this is a working group uh, that is supported by the opening for foundation. And we are looking into uh, sort of the, the higher levels of, of edge computing from the perspective of infrastructure. So we are collecting use cases and, and analyzing, the, analyzing the requirements to understand um, how you can build scalable um, solutions for the edge and how you can scale out from the core towards the edge and what kind of challenges you have when you're building this massively distributed infrastructure. Um, so we collected a couple of use cases and obviously we started from, from telco, um, like how Nitu was talking about uh, telco as well, because you need the connectivity uh, and the backbone networks. And um, that's kind of a natural starting point for, for edge computing, sort of a requirement, edge and 5G going hand in hand. Um, and in fact, with the, uh, we're always trying to make things um, easier and then we always end up in the, with systems that are more and more complex. Um, so even if you look into just the telco uh, network, AI is already applicable there uh, because uh, you need to ensure that uh, the connection is there, that you're able to do the phone call, that you're able to reach the edge site. Uh, there are um, strict SLA requirements, the five nines that you cannot have more than five minutes of network outage per year. Uh, it takes me more to drink my morning coffee. Um, so analytics uh, are really important there to uh, predict and prevent failures in your network. And as the complexity goes up, it's getting harder and harder sometimes to find where uh, the failure really is in the system. But uh, when we look into edge use cases, it grew way beyond um, telco. Um, so when it comes to farms, um, the second white paper that, that the Edge Working Group put out has a couple of use cases. And, and uh, one of them is actually a, an aquaculture use case, so shrimp farms. Um, and it's talking about how you can bring in automation um, into those environments. And uh, the environmental conditions can be, can be really rough out there. Um, the temperatures, weather, um, I think Jason talked about uh, the areas uh, where you have unprotected, uh, well, not necessarily large data centers next to a pond, uh, but unprotected servers and, and sensors and the environment. Um, so in use cases like this, it's also getting uh, really important to um, be able to uh, be on top of everything in terms of video surveillance and really the computer vision to be able to identify the workers uh, and those people who are breaking in uh, to cause harm or, or to stole some, steal something. Uh, also to, to keep the environment stable because the animals are really sensitive to the changes of the environmental conditions. You need to control the, the feeding cycle and also the life cycle of the animals from the larva phase uh, up until uh, to the point of harvest. And it can get a, a really complex process. And that's where, for instance, AI and, and machine learning uh, technologies can, can help a lot. And uh, the other areas that we identified were manufacturing and factory floors. Uh, like um, there has been a lot going on in terms of digitalizations in, in factories and, and automation. The current stage I believe is called Industry 4.0 uh, that really uh, targets to bring in cloud and, and bring in more and more automation to these factory floors. And when you look into the assembly lines and the robotic arms, uh, you really need that microsecond uh, of real time that, that I think Jason was mentioning earlier. Uh, so that's another area uh, where edge computing is, um, is getting into. And uh, I also mentioned that it's all about evolution. So when you look into the factory floors, there are a couple of industry industrial PCs, um, and they are really not fancy, uh, high-performing machines uh, in some cases. So uh, you need to be able to also utilize those as a, as a first step. Um, so if you look into uh, one of our projects, Starting X, 
um, they are working on a new feature. It's called Edge Worker Node, um, kind of a small agent-based approach um, to be able to bring in and connect in those uh, PCs on the factory floor into the starting X environment without the need of reinstalling the whole thing or uh, taking on more resources than they actually have. Thank you. Actually, those are really interesting examples. Um, thank you for sharing those with us. I want to ask me too, what are the needs of the edge in terms of connectivity and its ability to process information? I would say that um, we probably covered some of that here within the group a little bit already, but just to uh, bring it back together and building on the the advice that we got from Jason and also Sam and Nancy in particular, what I would probably say is, to me, it kind of breaks down into smaller components. So how the, the needs of the edge then become, what's our ability to capture the data in the first place? So these devices or people that are generating the data in the first place, how do we capture the data practically from those? Um, and then I'm thinking also then about the the, the way that we stream the data. So the network then becomes really important that these devices are connected to. So is this going to be wired? Is it going to be wireless? Is it going to be cellular? You know, what, what type of network is going to be most appropriate? Or is it going to be a combination of all of those? And maybe it is. And maybe maybe our customers and our our um, best users might not necessarily care about that because we need that that open network and system uh, and platform to be able to make that seamless experience happen. So I would probably say that those two are the, the big things that we would need to consider when we're thinking about the, the new applications that require low latency at the edge. And um, and then, then driving those security parameters around that would be the last one. So what type of security is then going to be required? Because if these are business applications that are running critical systems, it may require a different level of security. So you might require to bake that in into your network design versus something that is a, is a virtual reality experience for a consumer, for example. So two very different ends of the scale. Definitely. And maybe Aldiko, you can expand a bit on how edge computing uh, is meeting these challenges with the demands of AI when it comes to, to processing large amounts of data. So I may turn it a, a little bit around. Um, so um, we already talked about how you really do not want to move the data uh, if possible. At least um, some initial processing always happens at the edge because you just really can't really afford uh, to move large amounts of data, either because of latency or just the, the cost of, of moving that data. Uh, but when it comes to processing it, um, what I can see is that there are a lot of activities around um, adding accelerators um, to both on the edge and really on, on um, all uh, parts of the, of the infrastructure. So uh, a lot of work going into uh, making it possible to plug in GPUs, FPGAs, and, uh, and other hardware accelerators into your, into your system, uh, which is always a, an interesting topic from the perspective of how you balance it out to keep your infrastructure cost on a normal level while making sure that you can really address the needs um, of your use cases. Um, so when you when you look into these type of functionalities, um, it's one thing to um, have the accelerator available, um, and they can already process data uh, on high performance. But you also have to be able to feed these devices, so these GPU farms, uh, in several cases. So it's not just the the hardware that needs to evolve, and uh, the infrastructure software in terms of uh, being able to plug in that hardware the most um, efficient and, and performant way, but also the uh, the storage solutions themselves, uh, where you store the data, where you need to be able to access that data uh, fast enough. So uh, if you look into, for instance, um, 
the Swift Stack acquisition, uh, NVIDIA bought uh, Swift Stack uh, because object storage uh, becoming really appealing uh, in these use cases. And um, this is where uh, open infrastructure also uh, comes back because Swift Stack is based on an open source project, uh, the open OpenStack Swift project, uh, which is an open source object storage solution. Um, so uh, I mentioned already that performance dem demands are, are really high, but uh, there are multiple reasons for not being able to, to move the data. So that's also uh, always something to consider uh, that there are the uh, data sovereignty roles and data privacy. So sometimes even if you want to move that data, you, you can't because you're not allowed the, because of some rules and regulations. So in, in that case, you really have to move the compute to where the data source is. And uh, there are also uh, some trends um, in the past years of uh, disaggregation and decoupling services and uh, enhancing them uh, separately. But in case of AI and, and machine learning, uh, being able to uh, treat compute and storage as, um, as one item can be really important from optimization perspective. Um, so there are a, a few sub projects, for instance, in the uh, Open InfraLab uh, project that are being formalized and created to address uh, that kind of optimization need. Great. Thank you, Eldiko. Um, Nancy, I'm going to jump to you. Where are you seeing applications emerge in rural environments? Is there going to be an economic uh, model of some sort to support the deployment of edge in some of those areas? Sure. Um, as I'd mentioned earlier, we're really seeing focus on precision agriculture and energy. And of course, 5G is a key component to that. Now, once you take a rural area and you provide edge compute capability, then you can tuck in the things like distance learning, which are very important, especially now in this era of COVID, as well as telemedicine, right? So once that infrastructure is in place, you can, you can actually do an awful lot for the community and change the, the, the entire rural environment. Um, so from an economic model, um, first of all, there are billions of dollars through a course of about 20 programs, and I'm happy to have conversation offline with people for government assistance and funding. That's very, very helpful. But we're also finding that as you can deploy some of these solutions, you can, in fact, drive enormous economies within within an operation. So for example, we went into a greenhouse um, that, that, uh, that provides about 50% of the grocery store in the United States azalea plants. And by automating that greenhouse for temperature and sensors and moisture sensor, um, they have established that they can easily reduce their cost by 10% and their productivity. So an overall productivity from a waste, from a, um, you know, you don't want spoilage, you don't want wasted water, you don't want wasted heat, you don't want to kill plants for that. So I'm going to focus for a minute my answer on ag. And the reason I'm doing that is because um, around the world, we see a massive food shortage that is forecasted in the year 2050. And that is saying to the United States farmer that we need you to drive 70% increase in your productivity in the next 30 crop cycles, right? 2050 sounds like a long time from now, but 29, 30 crop cycles is not that long. So we're seeing applications um, and, and one of the comments I had seen earlier was, yeah, but low latency was not that um, important really. Um, today, maybe not, but, but tomorrow, when you look at a, um, uh, if you look at a cornfield, for example, and you look at the ability to put a drone and robot combination in place to go out and seek and find the problem and a drone to get a closer look at it. Those drones, I mean the robot to look at it, those drones are going to be pulling about two terabyte of data in a 10 minute 
flight, right? So that starts to become massive data, massive activity, but enormous success if they can treat small areas, if they can minimize the amount of fertilizer or pesticides and the economic or the environmental implications of those are extraordinarily important. This all then goes all the way through the food chain, right? So there's the stuff that's going on locally on the farm, but John Deere is equally interested in what's going on if they have ubiquitous coverage around the area. They can start to enhance their tractors. They can pull cost out of their tractors by being able to have real-time decision-making on the farm and be able to start to lower the cost of compute that they have riding on that tractor, right? Mm -hmm. Real-time data. If I'm Monsanto, I can start to look at seed and understand where geographically certain seeds are more effective than others. So I've turned into Farmer Brown in the last uh, 12 months, but, but it, it, it is absolutely incredible the technologies that are being driven um, throughout this entire industry and, and just ditto that when you look over on the energy sector. Definitely, and thank you, Nancy. I, I, wanna, I wanna also get Jason and me too. Can you just give me a quick in one to two minutes response on what you guys see as um, sort of the killer applications being being deployed the way that um, edge can be applied um, or AI can be applied to the edge um, within the coming years. Um, I mean, I'll jump in. So, you know, we talked about computer vision, we talked about, um, uh, you know, vibration analysis, anything that has high bandwidth data. Um, on the service provider edge, as we call it, that's gonna be broad services across lots of users, uh, serving up content, you know, but that's latency sensitive. No one's gonna die if my Netflix shuts off, unless you're like really into, you know, Queen's Gambit or Tiger King or whatever, but, um, you know, it, it, but, but meanwhile, your airbag, eh, probably, probably a problem. Um, so you know, uh, augmented reality is we've been talking about service provider edge, um, being able to serve up new things within a city, uh, low latency, um, cloud-based gaming, you know, is another big one, super, super low latency. Um, you know, a lot of people too, uh, there's this misnomer that 5G uh, is so fast and so low latency that, that um, it's gonna enable all the compute to go back to the cloud. I've had the question asked to me, it's like, well, with 5G, you know, this edge conversation is, is you know, limited. 5G is just going to make it all back. But the reality is, is 5G is a hyper-local connection. And you know, there's 5G is not one thing, you know, and um, 5G is a hyper-local connection. So you get a really fast pipe to that local small cell or the local tower, but then you have the same pipe to the back end. So you have to inherently push compute out to that, you know, that access edge because you're going to have a bottleneck upstream. You basically just created a highway you know, uh, near you know, near to the uh, asset, and you still got a little street upstream, and so that that's that's a major thing. And the other thing, I forget who it said it. Maybe it was me too. Like five G, yeah, you said you know three G, four G, five G. Five G is more about business models than it is about technology. Let's face it. First off, five G right now is a solution looking for a problem. It is not going to be consumer where five G uh, makes an impact first, because I mean. Great, I, you know, most people stream video these days, like, you know, until the apps catch up, it's not, you're not gonna notice anything. It's basically telcos trying to pitch it to try to make more money, like a reason for you to get new stuff. Um, uh, the other thing is um, it's going to change how people deliver networks to businesses. So private 5G network slicing, completely new service models and people that aren't even telcos starting to offer those service models. And then new edge com compute services around that. So I want to, you know, give other folks time, but like very, very different business models are going to be spinning up around these new technologies. Thanks, Jason. Me too. Um, just building on uh, um, Jason's uh, vision there, I wholly agree with all of those different aspects around gaming, around augmented reality, virtual reality. But I was thinking about how, how do we bring this home a little bit? Because when, you, when there is an advent of new technology available, getting people to understand what the art of the possible is, is quite difficult. 
And, and I think the pandemic uh, has taught us uh, some of that. And, and then some interesting examples have started to emerge. For example, um, a startup like Digital Barriers, working with the likes of Vodafone and also um, AWS, thinking about when you have masses of people coming through a station, how do you know who may be a suspect of COVID or not? How do we know that? And I know that there's all these digital passports being thought about now, but they're not there yet. So they were thinking about how do they use their live video streaming analytics to do temperature screening? So how do you get across 200 people, understand what their temperature might look like? And if you've got a few suspects there that might be close to having a high temperature, then how do you protect the rest of the passengers that are trying to use this public service? So it's really interesting that uh, um, you know, the, the technology will evolve, new use cases will absolutely uh, pop up, but I think there's going to be, uh, is purpose-driven. Um, whilst businesses want to also innovate for the, for the sake of innovation, but I think there's a purpose-driven approach here. And, and these are the types of examples, particularly in the healthcare side that we're starting to see that are probably ramping up a little bit faster than some of the other areas that we would probably see like in virtual reality experiences, for example. Definitely. Um, and before I, I want to jump into our next topic and, and then maybe slide into Q&A, um, but before that, I just want to get Andre's perspective here. Um, since a large part of the critical infrastructure OT is on the edge of organizational networks, uh, cellular technology is an enabler and an accelerator for connecting all these physical control devices uh, to the internet and cloud. So Andre, maybe you can share with us, what's your view on connecting the OT systems to the cloud, uh, to the cloud in terms of uh, security? I'm on. Okay, thanks for the question. So just maybe to focus, there is huge, huge networks, uh, huge networks of controllers and uh, embedded computers that are already in the field in the in critic, various critical infrastructure industries like uh, transportation, smart cities, and uh, energy, and uh, even communication networks. And now they are being uh, connected, increasingly connected to the network, to the internet, uh, because it makes sense. It makes uh, sense from the business use case, and it makes sense from remote work uh, and uh, inability to access these uh, controllers and installations. And many, and now the suddenly the everything is much more open in these uh, networks, which used to be closed and uh, protected by being isolated. And the data flows much more freely and uh, uh, people can access them remotely from, uh, from their homes even and uh, from the office uh, without going physically and connecting uh, only locally. And it creates big, big vulnerabilities uh, as anybody can uh, connect remotely. So the hackers can also come in and impersonate and uh, use all these standard tools that in their, they have in their arsenal um, to actually attack these critical infrastructure networks. And I think it's uh, building on the previous comments, um, the hyperconnectivity is also happening here and it's only accelerating and uh, there's nothing anybody can do uh, to stop it. And usually the security lags behind the functionality. Um, so, as uh, recent attacks on the infrastructure show it, uh, for example, the uh, not so long ago an attack on the Florida uh, plant, water plant. And the environments are very, very complex on the, on the edge for these controllers and sensors. Uh, multiple vendors, uh, old hardware and software, and it's very um, complicated to uh, add security or to open them up to the remote connectivity. Uh, without compromising uh, the integrity and the uh, uh, normal operation of the of the network, so it is very hard to change. And um, I think there are multiple approaches to how secure it, how to secure this kind of networks. Uh, our approach as uh, as hub security is to provide root of trust, hardware based root of trust. Uh, into these uh, networks on the edge uh, to the devices and on the edge side and also on the server side. 
which is fully transparent to the existing operation and existing uh, controllers and devices so that the network can operate freely uh, as usual and um, all the normal, uh, normal data and normal flows are enabled. However, all the uh, abnormal and uh, uh, malicious uh, operations are being, uh, are being stopped before they get the chance uh, to propagate in the network and uh, also to cause damage. Um, so it is, it's complex, it's hard, and um, I think it's it can be solved, uh, and uh, that's what what we are doing as hub security. Great, thank you, Andre. I definitely know there's some conflicts with it, adopting a zero trust approach when it comes to AI and edge computing. So maybe we can get a bit more into this uh, later on into the discussion. Um, I wanted to ask uh, Sam um, going into the topic of technical considerations and approaches now. Um, maybe Sam, you can answer for us. How, how can hybrid edge technology, cloud technology, sorry, enable um, the adoption? Well, we've touched on this a bit, but maybe just expand a bit on how it can enable the adoption of AI related applications um, and some of the, the use cases we didn't really get to ask you about um, about that. Sure, thanks, Journey. So uh, basically, um, let me maybe answer this in two parts. One is that, um, when it comes to the AI, the world of AI and machine learning, the whole concept was uh, adopted after human intelligence and thinking process, right? So which kind of, uh, it's a, the way we think and we learn is in multiple parts. One is the central knowledge that we learn and read and uh, get new information uh, on ongoing basis. Then we process it locally. We have our own brain, so we don't rely on others. And then we experiment with the knowledge. And then the third level is um, communicating with other humans. And in exchange of the information and knowledge, uh, our knowledge gets more and more optimized. And then collectively, we send that back to the central, uh, central place and get that information uh, updated. Now, that's exactly how uh, we're applying our technology into this whole um, uh, arena of in the AI and machine learning space. Uh, the way Mimix Hybrid Edge Cloud uh, platform works is that now we're decentralizing the systems and workloads um, when it makes sense off to the devices where the applications are running and generating data. We're putting data into action right at the edge. So uh, there is the training that Vera and everyone mentioned that is happening in the cloud on ongoing basis that gets downloaded to all these devices that are sitting on the, on the edge. Then the device is also feeding uh, the, based on the data that is getting generated on the apps on the device and is getting more and more optimized. And then it starts to talk to all these other devices and nodes and sharing knowledge and it's getting more and more optimized. So one thing to note is that our platform really enables the devices to now form clusters based on network, proximity and account and start communicating with each other and share knowledge and even microservice, which is functions like push functions to each other in a peer to peer fashion and also push AI model. For instance, I now to give you an example, I give you a couple of examples. Um, one um, uh, with uh, let's say CCTV cameras around the world. So the way it works right now is that there's this central control unit, people are sitting behind it, watching everybody or our lives to, to get information. Now, in the ideal and better world, the way it would work, let's say they are looking for a criminal and they have a model of the either the face of the criminal or the plate number. They would push that model to all cameras. Now, cameras start looking uh, for that uh, person based on the model that is running. Uh, 
uh, one camera detects the object, takes a picture, sends it to all the other cameras, send the notification back to the central control unit, as well as sending a notification to the local law enforcement office that, hey, I found this. So this is a true collaboration between all these devices based on the information from the central unit and as well as itself running and optimizing and sharing with others. So instead of now, everybody looking for everything, they're looking for a specific object and putting it more in a much more efficient way. Another example to give you, which is basically a use case that we developed with one of our uh, uh, partners in the automotive space. And it's something that is, that is happening today. I'm not talking about future. Um, uh, that's in, uh, in automotive smart city. So, um, Imagine uh, there's a car driving down the road. Uh, the car has a camera uh, built into it. Uh, the camera has the AI model of obstacles that is loaded onto it. Now the driver, the, the car is driving down. It detects an object or an obstacle ahead. It takes a picture of it. It sends it to the car infotainment system on the LCD. The driver will see that there is an obstacle coming uh, is, is ahead. At the same time, it sends the picture to the other cars in the vicinity, notifying them that there is an obstacle ahead. It sends a notification to uh, it sends a, a microservice uh, to uh, uh, to the smart traffic light that now the traffic light turns from green to yellow to red back to green to slow down the traffic. So at the same time, now it's communicating with all these other devices in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion and all of this without even the need to go to the cloud yet, right? So this is how um, we are seeing, and at the same time, updating each other because these other cars didn't have the model of the obstacle. Now it's taking the picture and sending it to them and sharing knowledge with them. So this is how we see uh, the, the world is moving forward. And this is how uh, Mimic is basically participating in this whole thing is simply bringing all of these compute to collaborate together when it makes sense and uh, putting the AI also into context because AI is something that is not one big brain sitting in a central place, it's in every device and it continually getting more and more updated with information, with data that is getting generated on the edge on these devices. And then collectively we're building this super AI, which is, uh, which is based on the collaboration amongst all these devices. And what really Mimic is enabling is enabling the devices to now communicate independent of the device type, device OS, network connectivity, and cloud connectivity. Uh, we even enable devices to talk to each other when they're offline, like without having internet connectivity, which kind of rural uh, communities uh, come into play in that angle. Um, uh, we're really horizontal. We're breaking through, uh, like we're breaking through vendor lock-ins. We believe the whole ecosystem needs to work with each other and it needs to work seamlessly in order for us to achieve this ideal uh, case that we're all uh, envisioning. And, um, and we've made it super simple. Um, I think I put it in the chat earlier. Um, anyone in the audience that is a developer or working for an enterprise, you can go to developer.mimic.com. That's where you can get access to our platform and uh, start playing with it. It's available for almost all operating systems. And there's nothing new that you really need to learn. It's basically where uh, we're br the same um, uh, software development methodologies and that you're using today for cloud deployment. Now you're using it for your front end application development. So uh, that's, that's what we're uh, basically adding to this whole mix. <laughs> Great, thank you so much, Sam. Thank you. Um, I would like to, to get to Q&A as quickly as possible uh, because we have about, I would say, uh, a bit over half hour left. Um, but Vera, I would really like to, to, to throw at you one, one last question, which is what are some other key considerations uh, when it comes to training machine learning models on device or on the cloud? I think this is just a 
important to get your your thoughts on this while you're here. Sure, sure. Uh, and uh, yeah, I guess it's a good time for this question, Chris. It also builds up on some of the exciting applications Sam was talking about. So how do we actually make that happen, right? What are the prerequisites for uh, either hybrid AIML or uh, AIML based solely on a device edge? So um, as we think about it, obviously every application is unique, right? And what helps here is to think user first and business needs first to determine which of these considerations and requirements would be relevant to your business and to your product. But just to generalize it a bit, I would uh, kind of go through the following framework. First of all, think of your target device constraints. Uh, this is particularly true when you're trying to do not just inference, but also training on device. And when I say device constraints, uh, first and foremost, uh, I mean, think memory, compute, power, right? Uh, obviously, for something like training at the edge, the requirements would be way high. Just to give you a bit of a benchmark here, some of the devices uh, running such applications, like training at the edge applications, uh, for example, NVIDIA Jets and Nana, right? Um, Pixel phones, uh, Pixel 2 and up. So pretty powerful devices. There are some exceptions to it, like some MCU powered devices, but those would give you way less of wiggle room. So uh, constraints is one thing. Another thing that it would translate into is the expenses that might entail. So say you have the freedom of deciding which devices, which hardware you would be running your application on. Uh, again, some of the more powerful uh, devices would, would entail specialized SOC, for example, uh, system on a chip that tend to be pricey, right? They can account for up to seven to 10% of uh, cost, for example, of a premium smartphone. So the decision to make here, uh, is it justified for you to impose this cost on either your business or your customer, right? Or would you rather distribute uh, this cost by using, um, by doing training on the cloud, right? And for example, uh, distributed through some sort of subscription type of business model. So cost is definitely something to consider here. Uh, another thing, something need to and some have alluded to is data. So to do training at the edge, we do need qualifying, qual qualifying data. And there are a few challenges here. One thing is that with training at the edge, data does not leave the device. What it means is that the data might be, well, most likely be smaller than the one you would use for a training on the cloud. Of course, it would be coming from a single user or device, right? So the shared size of the data. Second, uh, you might have limited ways to pre-process and label it. So that's another challenge. And uh, last but not the least is um, whether this data is really quality data your machine learning model can uh, train on. So data is a big consideration here. And of course, you know, whether you're even able to acquire this data through the target device. For example, does you need uh, vision data? Does your device have a camera to capture this vision data, right? This is uh, definitely a prerequisite to consider. And I would say last but not the least, very practical consideration for everything edge, <laughs> inference and training uh, when it comes to AI is uh, availability of tool stack and competencies. And uh, edge AI is still, I would say, is rather nascent. This is particularly true for training at the edge, trade, right? And the tool chains are just not as mature as they are for some other uh, domains of machine learning or uh, computing per se. Therefore, you really need to evaluate whether the tools that are available on the market meet your needs. And if not, whether you have competencies in your team to bridge the gaps that are allowed by those tools. So overall, I would say <laughs> just go through this framework, uh, target device constraints, cost considerations, uh, whether the data requirements are met, and of course, tools and competencies. And this will give you a pretty good idea whether it makes sense for you to do training at the edge 
and uh, I would say even largely speaking AI at the edge uh, as we talk about the device edge. Great, thank you, Vera. And and just to, to jump to to this to the topic of security that's on everyone's mind. I mean, Sam, you mentioned um, you know facial recognition, um, training algorithms. Vera, you mentioned training algorithms. Um, using inference. Andre, maybe you can just expand for us on the privacy regulations um, and compliance for AI as a service is today uh, a pretty huge concern for big and small cloud service providers, especially so for healthcare um, and similar highly sensitive applications that we were discussing. And even today we can see that there are several different approaches to, to solving this issue. For example, you know, hom homomorphic encryption and federated learning secure processor enclaves, um, but there's no clear clear leading solution. How do you see the future of privacy and security um, of AI cloud services? That's, that's a great question. And we're definitely seeing uh, also from our clients in general on the market, that's uh, the GDPR uh, regulations and the HIPAA regulations for healthcare creates a huge barriers for uh, adoption of AI as a service in, uh, in specific uh, broad industries like, uh, for example, MRI uh, pictures or sensitive genetic information processing as a service using uh, AI and machine learning uh, in the cloud. And uh, there are various approaches today that uh, try to solve this uh, problem in different ways, as you mentioned, several of them. And usually it involves a compromise. So either there is a full privacy security um, of the information on the cloud and the cloud provider can um, provide the full service uh, over the public network, uh, which is homomorphic, full homomorphic encryption, for example then everything is encrypted all the way, the application itself, the AI model itself is encrypted. And then the problem is the performance. So the cloud provider pays a lot in terms of performance. You cannot use the FPGAs and GPUs and acceleration engines. So uh, this is one approach. Second one is, um, Using federated, federated learning, for example, where the it can be mentioned also here, um, the machine learning happens on the on the edge. It happens in the uh, on the and in place of generation of the data. And there are other um, drawbacks in this approach, as it's not uh, generally it's not the same quality as. Uh, getting all the data from everyone in the same place and training the model on the full set of the data. Or processor enclaves, uh, secure processor enclaves, which also reduce uh, performance and um, known to be not so secure and uh, broken uh, uh, from time to time with many vulnerabilities. And so today there is no clear winner and um, uh, still, there's a the big organizations and cloud providers, especially like tier two cloud providers, uh, like telecom companies, uh, that wants to provide value-added services for their uh, communication infrastructure. Uh, they're basically um, um, stuck. So looking for a, looking for a solution and uh, the right approach that enable them to uh, to do both. Uh, high performance, uh, high throughput, very high throughput service, and also keeping aligned with the HIPAA and GDPR and other privacy regulations. And here, this um, one of the approaches that um, that we also use is to provide the full secure enclave on the uh, appliance level. So it also connects to the uh, zero trust uh, concept and. Uh, to the confidential compute concept, how to take the existing applications, the existing uh, processing power for GPUs and CPUs and uh, wrap them up with the full security suit and the uh, access control suit of, uh, of tools and, uh, and interfaces so that 
the application can run uh, in the same way as it runs uh, on the normal uh, normal server, normal, normal computer. And on the other end, it is uh, fully uh, governed and protected uh, from any uh, abnormal, unapproved access. And uh, it is it is a, it is a search and uh, still search on the for our clients. Um, think that's give, give, giving all the uh, uh, new things like zero trust and the confidential compute. This is something that uh, it is solvable and uh, something that we are uh, doing in sub security. Right. Thank you, Andre. And I mean, just because I I mentioned uh, Sam Sam's example, I'd like to also get get your input on that on this topic yeah sure sure thank you uh so um data privacy is a is a big one in fact uh that we've always everyone in our company been focused on and we've been talking about it everywhere so uh we believe that you can't leave the data privacy uh, uh to to trust and complex EULA agreements that are sometimes not humanly understandable due to all these legal jargons. Uh, and uh, today, unfortunately, that's how it works. Uh, all of the data needs to leave the devices and go to a third party cent uh, central place to get the stored, uh, processed and streamed. Now, what we are doing also with our platform is that now we are giving this, um, ability to the application logic to decide what data remains on the device and what data goes to the central cloud. And the data that remains on the device doesn't mean that it's locked into the device. Now the data producer, the data owner uh, will decide who, which devices will get access to that data for how long, when, for what tasks. So we're really giving control back to the data producers to decide how their content is being accessed, shared, and consumed. And we're not leaving it to the trust as it is, uh, as it is today. And then uh, the other thing is that uh, uh, when it comes to the data privacy, now the data is getting generated, for instance, on my device from one application. The way things work today is that all these unstructured data or raw data goes to somewhere central, and now it starts converting from unstructured to structured by going through certain processes. And uh, now with our technology, what we also enable is that at the app level on the device, the app can do part of this job and decide what piece of data, for instance, needs to go to the healthcare provider, what piece of data needs to go to the bank, uh, uh, bank uh, banking uh, infrastructure. So it kind of does part of that on a structure to a structure right at the application level on the device. So you're saving time, you're saving on cost and processing power. And also you're adding to the data privacy piece that you don't simply need don't need to load everything up to a central place and leave it to the trust and the processing to happen in the central cloud where you can now do it at the device, uh, make it more private, faster, and more efficient. So that's another angle to the hybrid edge cloud platform that I wanted to mention. Great. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Uh, did you Jason, I wanted to, to get your input on this. How do, how do I decide, how does an organization decide where to apply edge analytics along the continuum? And maybe you can also throw in a thought uh, or two about uh, data privacy and security. Yeah, I mean, I think we've covered the, the edge continuum. So we'll, I'll, I'll quickly say, all of the trade-offs that we've been talking about, um, you matter. How do you decide where to run a particular workload across the continuum? It's based on performance versus cost. And the fact is that's gonna change over time. You know, whether you're doing it in sort of a mesh fashion with, with what you know, Sam's talking about or otherwise, the key is you need to architect to abstract applications, data and domain knowledge from infrastructure. And if you do it properly, you can run workloads anywhere along that continuum based on that balance of performance and cost. So how you architect today is super, super important as things evolve over time. You know, we've traded things in the in the chat around AP, open APIs. As long as you have kind of the basics around open APIs, then everything can be as proprietary as you want around the wheel and still interoperate. 
So that's you know kind of how I would say there. Now, uh, we've been chatting in the ch chat window. Privacy is based on uh, a, a, a very careful balance of value received and you know the, the, your privacy. And I would argue that privacy is actually as much about people willing to give up privacy as it is about companies being you know willing to uh, protect their privacy. How many times have you actually gone in and changed the privacy settings on something like Facebook when you're talking with a friend and all of a sudden an ad pops up? Uh, with a, it's just kind of coincidentally around that conversation. A little creepy, but did you actually go in and change your settings? Probably not. Um, this happens all the time. If I told you 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that you're going to leave location-based services on pretty much all the time because you get, you know, you get value, you'd be like, you're crazy. Never would I do that. Most people now leave it on because they get value. So it's really important to think about that. Um, security, you know, to Andre's point, security is only experience, an experience if it's a bad one, as I like to say. Otherwise, you don't want to think about it. Um, all of the tools, generally speaking, are there for security. You know, uh, secure Enclave, Root of Trust, Measure Boot, Remote at Cessation, uh, Confidential Computing, um, Encryption at Rest, and all these different tools, Encryption at Rest and Emotion. Um, it's how you apply them. And same thing, everything's about a balance in technology. How do you make it usable so people will actually go with it versus it's so oppressive that no one wants to use your solution um, or people don't understand it because of there's mixed skill sets in the field. This is the challenge. Security usability is one of the biggest challenges. It's not just about the technology. In consumer, why do we have so many breaches? Uh, well, why are not that many? In IoT and consumer, why have there been more breaches there than in, in, in industry? Because developers made it easier to get instant gratification than it was to actually have security, or they just didn't know. You know, the hack about 2018 when millions of cameras took down the network up, up in the Northeast because it was this massive DDoS attack. I've heard different reports, but under 20 different usernames and passwords got into millions and millions of smart cameras because people could just bypass or you couldn't even change the password. So that, that's case in point. I'll also add that if those cameras had some semblance of AI locally or machine learning that, that would analyze the traffic pattern and say, wait a minute, it's all of a sudden going like in a weird way north towards you know, the, the back end, it could have shut down all those cameras at the source or uh, you know, analyze that, that uh, weird pattern in terms of you know, the hacking coming in for the DDoS attack. This is another example of why edge analytics is important from a security standpoint is to analyze things and shut things down at the source versus letting it go to a centralized location, then shutting everything down. Um, so it's, it's all about defense and depth. There's a lot of different layers to it. Um, but again, it's important. We have a lot of customers that come to us and just like, they're like, I don't know about security. Just tell me it's going to be okay. You know, they're caring, caring about the apps and all that. You do have to right size it to the app. If I'm a nuclear plant, I probably care about it a little bit more than if I'm turning on the lights in my house. But you know, it's, it's about that finding that balance. Everything's about finding a balance in technology and, and thinking about the people part. Great, thank you, Jason. And before we head into Q and A, maybe me too, you can, can wrap things up for us and that you can answer the question, um, why do we need an edge ecosystem? I mean, I think definitely this discussion highlighted a few reasons for that, but maybe we can get your perspective on it. Um, sure, um, we've covered a lot of ground today, but what I would say is the, the topic of ecosystem is really important as the technology evolves. There's, this cannot be offered or delivered by one single body alone. And what I would probably say is, is that um, thinking about the different uh, players within the ecosystem, maybe not all of them, but just to name a few, I'd be thinking about um, the businesses that help us capture data. So the device makers become very important in this equation. Then also the application makers who are creating the value, the end value, the application makers for the augmented reality, virtual reality type of experiences that we're talking about. So, you know, leaning on SAM and, and the software um, businesses, they become really important. So in that space, how we get to interact with API hubs also then becomes important as well. And, and whilst we're generating data, creating all of this value with some great applications, how you then access that through the network also then is an important role for the network providers as well. So we talked about cellular, wireless, wired type of networks from uh, local to WAN, you know, that whole piece there is quite a big spectrum and how that ecosystem then comes into play 
um, becomes key. And, and if we are trying to drive uh, new applications that require a super low latency at the edge, there are, there are going to be necessary forums that are going to help some of this technology e evolution to take place as well. So they may exist in different shapes and sizes at this stage, um, but these forums then become industry standards. So the industry standards also then becomes a key a catalyst in an environment like this. And lastly, what I wanted to say was um, the cloud providers, so how you get to process that data at the edge, then need the extension to what Vera was saying earlier about uh, the, the topic of power, memory, and also processing that data at the edge then matters. So all of these are just some examples of who needs to come together in an ecosystem to help drive this uh, collective innovation. Definitely well said. And I think that every single one of you on the panel is part of that ecosystem um, and helping to build uh, the foundations of the future of edge technology. So um, thank you everyone for for your perspectives and your vast insights. We had a really wonderful discussion. Um, and these are all really fascinating topics. Um, and um, they all require more deeper discussion. We already have been talking for almost two hours and maybe we haven't even scratched the surface, um, but we're really grateful that you could take the time to flesh it out for us today. Um, now I'd like to take just the opportunity to open the floor up to our attendees some of you have already asked some questions, so I'm just gonna throw them out. Feel free to, to jump in and answer. Um, some of them are not for anyone in particular. So um, if you guys have something to add, uh, feel free to respond. Um, I have a, my first question here. MS has launched Edge Computing Azure uh, Precept hardware and software platform. How is this going to how is this going to break into the technology world of edge computing landscape? Sorry, I'm, I didn't paraphrase. This was the question word for word, so. I mean, I'm glad, I mean, I know that Vera, I'm sure you have thoughts here, but I'm glad to chime in if, unless uh, I wanna monopolize time. But uh, yeah, Precept was just announced, uh, I guess yesterday um, at Ignite. And uh, I think it's part of a bigger trend. You know, and that's, I see another question here. One is everybody wants the easy button. So, you know, the clouds are trying to create an easy button. All the clouds are doing great stuff. And so let me give you hardware and software you know, as a service, just grab it and go and start doing AI, AI and all this cool stuff, um, which is great. But from a customer standpoint, it's very, very bad because you do not want to get locked into one cloud. Yeah, you, it's very important to have a multi-cloud strategy that starts with an open edge um, because it's, impossible for all of your data to go to one cloud when you start thinking about interconnected ecosystems and different stakeholders hitting a factory floor or a retail shop or whatever, supply chain, never gonna happen. So you wanna break that, that coupling point the moment data is created with open you know, stuff and then you can send data you know, to back in. And we're partnered with all the clouds. This is not you know, a ding at the clouds, but uh, most of the clouds, the multi-cloud strategy is send me all of your data and then you can pay me a bunch of money to send it anywhere you'd like. Um, if you start with an open edge, it's like you control from any permutation from, from edge to cloud. Um, so with Anthos from Google, you've got Outpost from AWS, you've got Edge Stack from Microsoft, you know, they're all trying to extend the cloud, you know, out, out to the edges as service providers, it's changing the game in terms of how, who's serving who. Um, and really there is some mentality, I think across the board of, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna land you there and I'm gonna expand you back into my cloud you know, when connectivity gets faster and all that, but I think that's not gonna happen. I think it's, it's here to stay. But even in that regard, we're gonna see more and more, Anthos is actually fairly open in how they're doing it, um, you know, from a, from a Google perspective in terms of it, much more uh, kind of multi-cloud. Um, I think we're gonna see customers demanding that openness. So over time, even though you would like to lock people in with your own edge, you know, cloud infrastructure and you know, easy button, you need to give customers the easy button while also giving the flexibility. And so that's, again, it comes back to the balance. Uh, you know, every developer wants the easy button. I wanna get the hello world fast, but I'm also, they need tools that make it secure and manageable so they don't have to reinvent it after they get past POC party of few. Um, I always joke people get into the POC friend zone. You know, they can't get out of the friend zone you know, into real production, but um, it's important to kind of look at it from where we're headed, it's gotta be open infrastructure. Uh, long term, but everyone's going to be trying to lock in near term. 
<laughs> yeah, let me just expand on that. So uh, I would agree with Jason that it's, uh, I guess, another example of public cloud really tapping into edge. And we've been seeing that over the past, I would say, three years or so, with AWS perhaps being the pioneer among the public cloud providers, really trying to uh, expand the continuum from uh, device to edge to cloud, right? And build the, uh, build the tooling along the way. Depending on the cl uh, public cloud provider, you would see a variety of strategies, right? You know, whether they're trying to support more connectivity or uh, edge analytics or uh, the security and, and authentication part of it. Uh, but in general, I would say there has definitely been growth <laughs> in this field. And uh, I only see it intensifying over the last, over the upcoming months and perhaps years. Uh, so while, you know, cloud interoperability and uh, ecosystem silos is definitely an issue, one thing I would like to say, I think in general, it's not, uh, their activity here is not a bad thing, right? Of course, it gives the developers uh, options. Right, and it's up to you. It's up to you know your business needs, your customer needs to decide which way to go. But in general, the availability of these options gives you a choice, and it's a good thing. Plus, uh, we do see that there is just more contribution in the space. So, for example, AWS uh, open sourced one of their products, or I should say, part of their products that is uh, a compiler. Right, that is a pretty handy tool, and again, it's a contribution to the work all of us uh, have been doing here in the HAI domain. So uh, my feeling is that, of course, you know, they have their business strategy, why they're doing that. But in general, their contribution to the field is going to benefit uh, us and the ecosystem overall. Well, I think the, the, the last word that is paramount to all of this is the development of an ecosystem, because there is there is no one group that's going to be able to, to take this forward. And uh, especially as you start to go out into outside of the metropolitan area where you have to count on a, a whole myriad of different suppliers um, to be able to get access. So it's, it is truly about the ecosystem and the value of, of the discussions like the one we're having today. Course, yeah, I say it, it takes it takes a village and anyone that tells you they can do everything run away. Yeah, sorry. Exactly. Uh, I actually that that's that that's a very important point. Uh, and I like to emphasize, you know, as a consumer, it's one thing uh, that I can choose to use Android or iOS uh, or, uh, you know, Apple, Google products. But it's another thing that for enterprises to be locked into one vendor for the rest of their lives and not have the ability. Now I've chosen this vendor, I have to stick with it and I cannot and my products cannot work cross ecosystem so it's really uh, important uh, to make sure that we're going cross ecosystem and cross platform and everybody will be able to talk to everybody to achieve that one unified experience so that's another thing that I wanted to highlight and that's back to what Jason explained Nancy explained everyone kind of pointed out to that Definitely. Yeah, one thing I'll add, and I'm going to leave it uh, open. Ecosystem, uh, real quick. Ecosystems, you, ecosystems used to be about developing a product and then go figure out who you can partner with to sell it. Now it's about developing an ecosystem into your product, and then you know building you know, the network effect across a lot of people. Uh, very, very different uh, mentality than how it used to be. It's really important to be build one, be part of one. Otherwise, you're going to die long term if you're not part of an ecosystem as a business. Sorry, yeah. uh, Mr. Nick, go ahead. Yeah, I just I'm going to have an ecosystem that, that I think is, uh, is worth a few minutes of your time to look at as interested parties. Um, we, at, we at Trilogy and the Rural Cloud Initiative have been able to partner with, with um, the state of North Dakota. And they have a series of ecosystems that actually work together. It's, it's really amazing to see public-private partnerships across the state that are working, whether it's um, at the farm by having a live farm with sponsored programs from North Dakota State 
to make sure that the startup is is um, is able to get support and doing valuable uh, commercially available topics. They're working with the state to ensure that um, there are programs that train coders to code in 20 weeks so that we can start to uh, to work the skill set issues. They have a group that is working with the Air Force on the other side of the state, building a blueprint for the landscape of drone navigation, for the equivalent of a landing of uh, an interstate highway. Um, and I could go on and on and on, but this is a, a world-class organization that has been created up in the state of North Dakota to work on all things about advancing technology where AI and edge are absolutely at the forefront of making all of this happen. And there's some fantastic lessons and it's, it's great to be involved with them. I can help you with that, but really a world-class ecosystem that's been built up there that works together. Thank you, Nancy. I mean, that was going to be my next question for you as a follow-up to that, which is the limitations on broad, broadband or connectivity um, in general or in, in rural America. Um, but uh, you expanded on that a bit. And now maybe you, you want to add a point or two and I will ask the next question. Sure. Um, you know, I, I had mentioned that Chad Roop, the uh, administrator from the USDA, is on our advisor group. And in chatting with him yesterday, he told me that there were actually 30, 60 million um, people that do not have broadband access in the United States today. That's, that's pretty stunning. Now, a lot of that tends to be tribal land or the um, Eskimo villages, but there's still a lot of holes. And so the ability to have consistent coverage is what's gonna be paramount to being able to allow a John Deere to drive these great inventions that can be, um, be enhanced with AI. So, so we at Trilogy are building a nationwide VPN in conjunction with the major cloud providers so that we can help really quickly build out this infrastructure. But, but this whole consistent coverage is going to be a major limiter in the ability to take advantage of these technologies. So we're racing as quickly as possible. We're gonna ask for as much help from the people on this call as possible, but it is about getting 5G deployed nationwide. It's about getting um, private CBRS deployed out on the sites. And there's a lot of money going into that space, but there are a lot of hands that are needed to do that. And going back to the ecosystem, it takes a great ecosystem like partners on this call. A question here um, from Jawad. Uh, he put in parentheses, the OpenStack guy uh, from Science HPC Center of University of Copenhagen. My question is directed to Adiko in particular, but anyone on the panel can answer, of course. Um, how, can edge computing fit into the high performance computing domain? Yeah, I, I did give a, a short uh, text answer as well, just in the interest of time. Uh, but uh, if we bring this up on the panel, I'm not necessarily a, an HPC expert myself, uh, but I believe that how edge computing is representing this technology evolution that probably will um, boil into or uh, get into uh, HPC as well and how workloads are, are being distributed and also um, how we are using AI and ML more extensively and how we can improve simulations with that, for instance. And I assume that the other way around applies as well, like how you can um, apply um, HBC concepts uh, when you are practically enhancing your edge as we talked about accelerators and again how AI and ML is getting into the cars and, and on small devices learning and feeding on smaller data sets uh, just that it needs from this environment. So I assume that it kind of goes both ways in terms of uh, how the, these areas can collaborate and sort of learn from each other and, and take those technologies uh, into places where they haven't been before. 
Star Trek. Um, we have another question here. Someone, one of our attendees wrote, uh, I would be interested in learning how the big tech cloud vendors are reacting to this movement. I'm sure they understand the importance of edge, but I think they recognize that central cloud will compete with edge over certain use cases. I would assume they would want to influence the entire ecosystem from central to edge. Not sure what it means for new innovative companies. Maybe Nancy can, can step in on that one. Well, I mean, we're finding a tremendous willingness uh, to work with, with those cloud providers because they understand that ultimately the traffic is going to have to get carried. You know, some level of that traffic is going to happen locally or the, the work will happen locally. And then a large part of that's going to then move across the, across the cloud. So um, we're busy forming relationships with, with all of those um, providers for multi-tenant cloud access. Uh, I can add to that as well what Nancy mentioned. Um, I think uh, they are aware of it. They're well on board with it. I mean, uh, we have uh, Amazon is our partner. IBM is on our partner. We've been working with them very closely over the past uh, year and a half, I should say. Um, uh, and uh, it, it was actually the easiest discussion because they understand this is a natural uh, ev ev evolution of cloud and that's where everything needs to go eventually. And uh, it's really uh, my understanding of it being that they do see that the, the, we need to work together because even in the customer adoption world, uh, I mean, only 20, as Gardner stated, only 20% of the businesses have gone through their digital transformation and 80% is just about to unlock uh, that world. And uh, there are limitations to the way the central cloud is working today. For instance, connectivity is one big one in many, I mean, rural communities is one, but for instance, in mining you don't have necessarily connectivity all the time and this is where technologies around edge in combination with cloud would be a savior and would be a solution another example of it is the uh, data privacy at the enterprise level some enterprises are simply avoiding to go the central cloud route because they feel like all of the inter business intelligence data is going to the cloud so they want to avoid that and that's again where edge together with cloud and the example of uh, I gave earlier as how you can decide what data goes to the cloud, what doesn't, that ability would be the solution. So I think they do see that this is, uh, this is, uh, this is uh, the path to future and this is how things should evolve. Uh, so I, I, so far from our experience, we haven't seen any resistance. It's been more, more about collaboration and it's yeah. not really competition is complementing each other. Yeah. And, and I think just to add one more point is it, if you look at the CBRS auctions that, that just concluded, um, you know, there are some interesting players that are really getting into that. And so we're finding the likes of, of Google who's saying, well, we have an edge um, in the metropolitan area. So how are we going to expand that? You know, the same type of activity coming out of Microsoft. And then you look at, at Dish and, and, and just the different people that have bought Spectrum um, show that this is an ever-changing market. And uh, there is a lot of coopetition. Coopetition, is that the right word? Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> it's gonna be taking place here for sure. One thing I know we're at kind of at time, but I'll, I'll highlight. So on the clouds, um, five years ago, every new market starts with everyone coming out swinging, trying to own everything. And it's going to be awesome. And I make all this money. And then people start to get into their, you know, the, I call it the go-to dance move. Like do one thing really well, because you'll never do everything well. And, and look at, so I'm not going to name names, but look at the, over the past five years, first, the major industrials came out. Uh, there was one in particular that everyone probably knows. I'm going to build everything myself and my, my data centers, like everything. I'm going to own the whole stack and that cratered. And then other folks come in and like, I'm going to build uh, my own software platform, but I'm going to run it on AWS and, and Azure and whatnot. Well, cool. But that started a crater. Now the trend is, you know what? I'm going to apply my necessarily unique hardware and software and domain knowledge to public cloud infrastructure or the kind of things we're talking about, because it's not valuable to re redo the bottom. 
It's just not. And, and that's also, again, why the open uh, stuff that we're talking about and, you know, Dika and I like have a <laughs> very common mentality, but that's why you're seeing more and more of that pick up because it is not valuable <laughs> to reinvent the wheel. It is valuable to offer great services and software and hardware and don't do undifferentiated heavy lifting, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And a lot of people are starting to kind of realize that we've seen a very big change in the market over the past five years. And then the real potential again is interconnected ecosystems and you must have open. And that's where the trust fabrics come in, yada, yada. So anyway, it's, it's, it's really cool to, to, to see that transition happen. Um, I'm going to go to our final question. Um, I'm going to give us until 15, uh, whatever clock you're on. Um, we have a question here um, from someone with a cybersecurity background asking, how do you govern the edge IoT supply chain in regards to cybersecurity, both in the edge and on the cloud? Andre or it's anyone else? Um, now, Andre, if you want to, I mean, I can chime in, but I want to make sure everyone is balanced. Sure. So that's a, that's a huge problem for, for the edge devices. And I think that's actually where the blockchain can, uh, comes in. It's like, how, how do we create a trust in the supply chain with uh, many different stops on, uh, among, along the way where the chips are coming and where the boards are made and packaged? Um, so the blockchain with this decentralized technology that uh, and immutable ledger uh, that you can uh, that you can verify as the end customer of the device is uh, greatly helpful in this regard, I think. Um, so that don't actually have to like use papers and old old fashioned old fashioned tools that are easily hackable and uh, changeable uh, to create trust in the supply chain. Uh, but to use the, the same distributed uh, ledger and, uh, and digital, uh, digital signatures and digital uh, security uh, to create uh, authenticity and trust in the, um, in the supply chain of the, of the tools and of the, of the parts that are actually installed on the in the edge devices. So all the way from the manufacturer and uh, up to the installation and also for the rest of the life cycle of the device, including the firmware updates and the identification. Yeah. And, yeah here's, why, here's why I would say, sorry. Um, here's why I say industry collaboration matters too. I mean, exactly. Like it's a, it's a layered approach. Um, you know, it's not gonna be one technology. You also need to kind of look at the uh, secure code. What's the, you know, the hardware provenance, but also the code. And that's again, where open source can help because you've got a bunch of eyeballs on it. There's transparency, um, but interoperability. And also important is you have to automate it because people inherently make mistakes. And then of course there's other people that intentionally, you know, maliciously do things, but you have to take the person, the people equation out. And that's where these technology, you mentioned ledger. There's a lot of other technologies, um, you know, nothing against people, but you know, you've got to take it out. And sorry, Nancy, you were going to say. Well, I was uh, to your point. The 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 weakest link in security is humans, right? Yeah. So, um, from uh, an IoT or industrial IoT background, which is something I was doing a couple of years ago, um, it is having zero trust. It is making sure that those uh, devices. So, if I'm in a, a water supply, um, there's no reason why. Um, one of those sensors ever needs to be able to get onto Amazon, right? It only needs to, to be able to talk to certain devices and then it is having a defense in depth. But it is that person because, uh, you know, one of the things that, you know, those of you that are in the security market know that a couple of the different casinos in Las Vegas were hacked by somebody putting in a water feeder temperature control sensor in an aquarium and people yeah. were able to pull out high roller databases um and and who knows what else right there's no reason why you should be able to go into a a water feeder or a fish feeder and access the financial records <laughs> of a casino right and and that is huge problems that that inexpensive iot devices enter into so if you're not careful, you have a botnet army that uh, that that is IoT. So a lot yeah, of one, work. 
Yeah, the one thing I'd say about IoT sensors, devices, is that you can be as oppressive as you want, and I'm not going to complain back to you. You know, unlike people, they're like, oh, this is too hard to use. So you, you can yeah. put in the right measures. Uh, a lot of people talk, you know, that, that casino one's a great example. A lot of people talk about the department store, won't name names, that got hacked into through the HVAC system. But that was like literally a contractor lost their username and password. Someone logged right in, and the problem was segmentation between the OT and IT network. It, that was what it is. Everyone's like, oh, IoT is insecure. That was an oversight. And so you've got to separate out where can it not be secured from where did people not apply the right security? It's very different. Right. That's right. And, and it's a risk, right? It, it's a matter of defining risk, right? Because um, again, the HVAC system never needs to have access to the financial systems. Probably and not, yeah. There are likely areas that cost of advanced security are not all of that important, right? By LifeLock, I've always told my friends. So, um, yeah. but, our, but our industry is in trouble. Hackers are only going to get more and more creative. Um, so we're also going to need AI to combat AI, by the way. So <laughs> there's that. Yeah, and it's a whole other panel. Very, it's also coming very personal. I mean, we are talking about casinos and retail, but we have smart homes now, these sensors and software is in your car. So it's, it's not just someone else's property and someone else's warehouse. It's your home, your life, yeah. your car. We are all getting connected and being part of this edge and with the challenges of it as well. Yeah. Definitely. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today and thank you to our speakers, um, Andre Armenko, Nitu Koshu, Sam Armani, Jason Shepard, Vera Serdokova, Ildiko Vancha, and Nancy Shemuel. Um, I really, really enjoyed today's discussion. I think our audience did as well. If you guys want to find a recording of today's uh, panel, you can find it on YouTube. And um, also to get in touch with any of today's panelists, feel free to reach out to them directly. All of today's attendees uh, will be receiving an email in the coming days with the contact information of each of our panelists. So don't be afraid to drop them a line. And uh, if you have further questions on any of today's topics, uh, feel free to reach out to them. Um, I think many of them are, are happy and open to, to having a deeper discussion on many of these topics um, and just the short promo to stay up to date with Hub Security's upcoming webinars. You can follow us on Twitter and on LinkedIn, and you can also check out our weekly digest on Medium, the latest stories coming out of the cyber and security sphere. Thank you everyone so much once again for joining us and I hope that you're staying um, safe and healthy at home. And we hope to see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so thank much. You. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> All right. Yeah, thank you. Bye. 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 bye.